Hello everyone, I'm Sister Vasa and live from Vienna, Austria, it's Saturday morning. How are all of you out there? It's so lovely to see you again, my friends. I have a special guest for you today. He is an old friend of our show and a dear friend of mine, Father Archimandrite Kirill Havarun. I recently finally finished reading Father Kirill's book, The Scaffolds of the Church, a very important book about ecclesiology and about the structures of the church, including hierarchy and uh, administrative structures like autocephalies, patriarchates, and so forth, and about the priesthood and its place in the church's life. So I wanted to talk to Father Kirill. I had lots of questions for him, and he was very generous with his time, and I'm very glad uh, to share the conversation I had with Father Kirill about this important book. For those of you who might not know about Father Kirill, he is professor of ecclesiology, international relations, and ecumenism at the Stockholm School of Theology, St. Ignatius College. He is a graduate of the Theological Academy in Kiev and also of the National University in Athens. He accomplished his doctoral studies at Durham University under the supervision of Father Professor Andrew Louth, who's also a friend of this show and has been interviewed on Saturday Morning Live, in case you missed that one. Father Kirill's church and academic positions in the past include having been chairman of the Department for External Church Relations of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. He was first deputy chairman of the Educational Committee of the Russian Orthodox Church, and later he was research fellow both at Yale and Columbia Universities. He's been visiting professor at the University of Münster in Germany. He's been an international fellow at Chester Ronning Center for the Study of Religion and Public Life at the University of Alberta in Canada. And he's been director at the Huffington Ecumenical Institute at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles and assistant professor at that same university. The last time I interviewed Father Kirill, he was in Los Angeles, uh, hence I was holding this mug. I'm holding this mug today, however, even though he's not in California, he uh, is in Ukraine with his family, but out of solidarity, my friends, with those of you suffering on the west coast of the US of A from the wildfires, uh, today I have my California mug. Now, I should mention that Father Kirill is a prolific writer, and aside from the book about which we'll be talking with him today, The Scaffolds of the Church, he's also author of other important books. Uh, for example, this book, I have it right here. I'm still reading it, uh, Meta Ecclesiology. This is also a good read about the basics, I think, of uh, Orthodox ecclesiology. He is also author of Political Orthodoxies, the unorthodoxies of the church coerced. And I should mention sacred architecture in East and West. But that's all I'll tell you about Father Kirill's very impressive CV and bibliography. Before we get to the interview with our guest, I'd like to remind you that we do have a popular weekday podcast. That's an audio podcast called Morning Coffee. We have new people signing on uh, almost every day. And if you want to join the fun there and start your day with a brief reflection on the saints of the day, I cover both a saint from the new calendar and from the older calendar. And if you want a reflection on the scripture passage of the day and perhaps a liturgical text, then join us there. You won't regret it. And you can sign up actually for as little as $1 a month and you get access to all these morning coffee podcasts that uh, are posted every weekday morning. And we have a very engaged audience, over 500 people that also chat under the podcast, share their insights, and uh, as I said, are aware of what's going on in the church calendar, not only on Sundays, but in between, you can stay grounded and follow a bit. It's not long. It's a brief audio podcast that you can listen to, whether you're on the treadmill in the morning, taking your morning walk, if you're stuck in traffic, going to work, or whatever you're doing, just preparing your 
coffee in the morning, uh, you could listen and carry into your day some faith-based inspiration. So sign up here at patreon.com slash sistravasa. Try it out. You can always unsubscribe if you like, and it's a good way to support our little online mission. But that's it for my plug. Let's now meet our special guest, Father Kirill Havarun. Hello, Father Kirill. Welcome back to our show. Hello. It's very nice to be uh, to be at your show again. Well, you know, I'm very thankful that you're generous with your time uh, when it comes to this show. Uh, I want to discuss, as I've already warned my viewers, your wonderful book that I finally got around to reading. I'm embarrassed to say that I only read it now. Um, I want to discuss this book with you. I want our viewers to be aware of the book. If you want a good read, uh, read this book, The Scaffolds of the Church. And if you have, you know, uh, a desire to dabble in ecclesiology, as one does sometimes, uh, then I would suggest this. Now, I have really read the heck out of this book, my friends. Oh my I have not, uh, you wow. know, neglected to show my affection for this book in the form of destroying it with all of my notes. Uh, but because it doesn't have many blank pages, my friends, I have additional notes, additional notes about this. Oh, unbelievable. Uh, yes, I don't want to scare you, Father Kidiel, but I do have questions for you. Oh my uh, goodness. Oh. <laughs> Shall we stop now? Shall we stop our conversation right now? Because <laughs> what can I say? I come, I come well armed to this conversation. Very well. Uh, Thank uh, you. Really, there are very broad issues. Uh, my friend, that I would like to ask you about and that I'd like you to explain uh, to our viewers. And first of all, I want to say, uh, as a very general understanding that I have of the thrust of your work, uh, is that, you know, you have, uh, you have gone to great pains to uh, explain to us uh, the difference between that which is essential to the nature of the church uh, and that which is not essential to her nature. And you have described the structures of the church, including hierarchy, autocephaly, other possibilities of church administration. You have called these like scaffolds or scaffolding of the church. That is something that is useful to serve the primary purpose of church, that is unity, right? Uh, but it, the scaffolding does not actually form part of the actual building. So um, with that little introduction, I'd like for you to tell us in broad terms what you mean uh, when you say that while hierarchy does not belong to the nature of the church, ministry does. And you describe what you see in church history as a transformation from uh, ministry to hierarchy. Right, yes. Yes, I'm pretty sure that there could be misconceptions and mi misperceptions uh, of this differentiation that I indeed make, and you, you grasped it well uh, and described it in, in a very good, comprehensive way. Uh, indeed, uh, before I uh, delve into more details about this differentiation, I'd like to say uh, one, well, a couple of words about the, the title of the book. Indeed, when you know, my English is not my, English is not my native language. So, uh, only after I picked up this title, "Scaffolds of the Church," I realized that it has actually a double meaning: a scaffolding and scaffolds in the sense the place where people get executed. Uh, so, um, and then I thought, well, probably this double meaning fits the the book because when scaffolding gets abused and substitutes uh, the, what, what I call the nature of the church, that, that becomes the scaffold for the church, when it gets, or people of the church, when they really get, you know, where they, where they suffer. This is the source of, of troubles in the church. Um, so, yes, it's uh, a methodological kind, kind of differentiation that I, they, that I suggest between the nature and the, what is around the nature. Uh, I tried to use essentially the categories which had been developed um, in the classical patristic era 
and I am really fascinated by those categories. They all stem from uh, the book uh, categories by Aristotle, and they were later on um, interpreted by a bunch of um, commentators on Aristotle, primarily Neoplatonic commentators, but also Christian commentators. There was a huge culture of commenting on Aristotle, and particularly on this book categories, and it, it, it became a kind of framework uh, for theology as we know it, classical theology, the framework which has been forgotten. We don't operate, operate in the same framework nowadays. Uh, so my idea was to bring back this framework somehow to explore ecclesiology, the phenomenon of the church within it. And nature, the idea of the nature of the church comes exactly from that net network, from that uh, um, matrix as it were, <clears throat> uh, of the categories based on Aristotle, on Porphyry, another Neoplatonic commentator on Aristotle, which became extremely popular in the Christian uh, environment milieu. So yes, uh, the nature is something which is pertinent to the church, which, which was always in the church. To use uh, the wording of uh, the fourth century, the discussions uh, around Arius and you know the Arian theology, uh, we could say that just like, you know, uh, Saint Athanasius said there was no time when there was no sun, and Arius said there was time when there was uh, there was no sun. We could we could say that the nature of the church is something that always existed in the church, so that there was no ecclesial time when there was no church. Uh, so the nature is something which is pertinent, uh, which is uh, innate uh, in the in the very phenomenon of the church. While the scaffolds, uh, the structures, I call them also the structures of the church. Uh, they emerged um, in the history of the church uh, at some stage, and they usually served uh, uh, served some and some challenges, or they responded to, to some challenges that that the church faced from time to time. So they are temporarily uh, um, things. Uh, the structures are, by definition, something uh, that is temporarily that is ephemeral, even. And what is more important, they are not pert pertinent to the nature of the church. And I believe that uh, sometimes we face problems in our church life because we confuse the two things, the two aspects of the church. We confuse the nature, what is essential, what is really important, what really does matter for the church with what is temporarily, what, what, what was uh, subsidiary, what was invented in order to facilitate the church to develop. Um, and I believe, well, hierarchy, uh, the phenomenon of hierarchy uh, is one of those things. Um, I deliberately chose this kind of provocative focus on hierarchy, even though I could choose, you know, other structures in the church, there is a plenty of them, and they, I address some of them, but not all of them in my books, in my book. Uh, and I made this deliberate choice uh, uh, because I understand that in modern theology, in the framework of the Eucharistic ecclesiology, and I know you are liturgist, you like uh, speaking about li uh, liturgy, Eucharist, and it has to do, well, the book has to do with the phenomenon of, uh, of, of Eucharist, certainly. So in the framework of the Eucharistic ecclesiology, an idea emerged that uh, hierarchy is something which is really pertinent to the church, which is central to the church, because hierarchy is something which is requested to, to celebrate a Eucharist, uh, to perform a liturgy, uh, hierarchy was elevated to the level of being, you know, uh, in the indispensable, uh, substantial, uh, uh, ontological even uh, for the church. Some theologians made the conclusion that uh, hierarchy der der derives from, you know, from God himself, from the Trinity. And uh, they try to substantiate hierarchy as an ontological phenomenon within the church the core of the church, as it were. And I, I'm, I'm afraid this is a very wrong perception. This is a, a, a misleading identification of the church with the hierarchy. And I try to, you know, to study historically the origin of this, uh, uh, of this thing, the hierarchy. I discovered the roots of the hierarchical thinking in Neoplatonism, uh, which indeed influenced Christianity in many ways, both positive and negative ways. Uh, speaking about the categories which were used, appropriated by the church, they came to the church through Neoplatonic, through the Neoplatonic tradition. So I discovered the roots of, uh, of this hierarchical perception in the works of, of Proclus, one of the prominent uh, Neoplatonic philosophers. And uh, 
uh, hierarchy is most, uh, was very important for, for, Neo, for the Neoplatonic philosophy more than for, for Platonism, because well, Neoplata Neoplatonists, they, unlike maybe earlier generations of, of, of pagan uh, philosophers, they were, were devoted, you know, polytheists. They really devoted, they really believed in many gods. Uh, and they uh, made a point uh, of their polytheism probably in contrast to Christianity, which insisted on, on, on one god, on monotheism. Uh, so they needed hierarchy to, you know, to order their gods, many gods, and to place them to different, you know, tires, as it were. So hierarchism emerged as exactly a response to this polytheistic pagan uh, need to place gods, you know, in different cells, as it were, in, in the heaven. If hierarchy, I think maybe it would be useful to have a definition of the term, uh, because, you know, you do explain that it literally means, if we just take etymology, you know, sacred principality, right? Yeah. Hierarchy, sacred principality, you say that that comes from, well, you just told us uh, where it comes from. Just now that with it very slight. That's fine. Proclus, essentially from Proclus, and the word was coined not by Christians; it was coined by by the Neoplatonists. And actually, I tried to study all the cases of the usage of the word hierarchy in the Christian literature, and I can't find anything reliable. I mean, trusted sources. There are some uh, pseudographer uh, that mention hierarchy before the fourth century, essentially. But you you yourself just said. It, hierarchy, they needed it to order the gods. So for me, it's interesting that you say that it's about ordering. So is, is any kind of order uh, a hierarchy? I mean, where it involves the authority of someone over it. Yes, exactly. Well, that was the idea with which uh, Cedar Dionysius, the author whose identity we don't know, but uh, who we know as under the name of Dionysius the Areopagite, introduced this notion from, from Proclus and he essentially copied uh, uh, you know, pieces from Proclus without uh, referring to him. Uh, so it was a kind of plagiarism by modern standards. Uh, so he copied some of his ideas in and even words, including hierarchy, and, in, and uh, uh, brought them to, to the Christian theology with the idea to demonstrate how the divine grace uh, pours upon the Christians, how the Christians get access to the divine grace. And his point was that it's not a direct access, but it's rather an, an indirect direct access through the hierarchs. Um, and uh, the Cedar Dionysius' uh, take on hierarchy was extremely optimistic, very pious, very kind of insightful, spiritual, and so forth. That's why he was so much liked by um, many, you know, mystical theologians in the in the in the posterior era, like Maximus, the Confessor, like Simeon, the New Theologian, and so forth. And uh, his take was, yes, I would say a bit naive uh, and uh, very spiritually kind of uh, centered. But later on in the centuries, uh, through his translations, uh, he exercised these, uh, these ideas, exercised tremendous influence upon the structure, the political structuring within the Christian uh, empires in the Christendom. And, and in the church. So they led essentially to the formation of the hierarchy as we know it now. And because Dionysius tried to demonstrate that this, hierarchy, this is the way how hierarchy works in the, in the heaven. And he actually substituted the Neoplatonic gods with angels. That's why an, an angelology is extremely important for Dionysius. Uh, because if there are no angels, there are no, no kind of substance for hierarchy. Uh, and angels are desperately needed to demonstrate that there is a hierarchy in the heaven. You cannot say that the, tri tri uh, that the Christian God, the Trinity, is hierarchical because the Christian God is anti-hierarchical. That is my point. Because the, in the fourth century, they really demonstrated that God is well. The persons of the God of the Christian God are absolutely equal. They are non non hierarchical. Uh, so you cannot uh, bring uh, the Christian God as a model of hierarchy. That's why for Dionysius, it was the world of angels. And he paid an, a, 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 huge a huge attention to, to the angels. So he placed the angels in the heaven to different pious, as it were. And then he uh, 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 linked this idea with another Neoplatonic concept, concept of imitation or of uh, participation that whatever is down on earth uh, is structured in accordance or through the participation in the structures 
up there in the heavens. And because there are those uh, angelic hierarchies up in the heavens, they uh, impose or project the structures of the, on, the, on the heavenly hierarchies, including political and church hierarchies. I should say, by the time of Dionysius, we, well, we can assume that he lived uh, sometime uh, in the fifth century. And by that time, uh, the church and imperial structures became very similar to each other. They assimilated to each other. That's why uh, his model fitted perfectly both the church and the empire because there was no really difference between them. They were, there was only a distinction. That's how the idea of hierarchy became kind of appropriated both in the church and in the political uh, system of the Byzantine empire. That's how, how we live with it even, even now after the empires you know, perished, but the, the church preserved these hierarchy, hierarchical structures. And again, maybe anticipating some of your questions and responding to the questions that you've also already uh, asked, I should say that I'm not against hierarchy as such. And my point is not that hierarchy is bad because the church adopted hierarchy as a structure in, in, at some stage of its development the church deemed hierarchy to be useful, and indeed it was useful, and it is, it is, is useful. My point is that hierarchy does not belong to the nature. Well, this is, the nature this is my question to you um, about it that I mentioned to you before in our correspondence. Uh, I find it difficult to not see the hierarchy there at the beginning. Why? Uh, because number one, when our Lord chooses very clearly uh, 12 disciples, and then, and then another, I think the way it says in Luke 10, and then another 70. Um, I just don't see what the point is of this specific limited number. And then number two, the first thing that the disciples do after the ascension, as if this is like a sine qua non for the church to have, okay, it's before Pentecost, but still their first instinct is that they need to choose at, right after the ascension, someone to fulfill the number of the, the fallen away Judas, right? Yeah. It doesn't say explicitly in Acts 1 that it's for the 12 and not for the 70, but it says that it's to replace Judas explicitly. And St. Peter, when he gets up to explain the reasoning, he says, we need for him to be, uh, you know, to witness with us, someone who was with us from the beginning, you know, eyewitness to Christ, to witness with us to the resurrection. Okay, why would he say we need someone to be a witness with us to the resurrection when everyone gathered there, there were the women there and the whole community was there in Jerusalem in the pristine church. Why was, there necess why was it necessary to elect someone specifically for this, as Peter says, for this uh, ministry? And he says, uh, he, he, he talks about, another needing to take ton episcopon, like yeah. a bishopric of, uh, of him. So my question is, what is that? What is this limited 12, if not a hierarchy? Yeah. Well, first of all, we really don't know about the structure of hierarchy of the church uh, in the first decades, uh, maybe even centuries, first two centuries of, of the church. Uh, the evidence is very scarce is very limited and uh, we can only guess uh, what really happened with the hierarchical services or ministry at the time. We don't even know uh, what Presbyterian, to be a presbyter or to be a bishop meant at that time. Uh, but uh, certainly we know for quite sure that um, Christ himself rebuked any idea of hierarchy among the disciples when they argued who would be closer to Christ, who would sit uh, in the first place uh, in his kingdom, he said that don't follow the, the examples of the, of the pagans, of those outside, because those who want to be first need to be last. And that is exactly the anti-hierarchical concept that he promotes. Uh, he, he made it very, very clear, don't follow the patterns of, or if you want, administrative or organizational organizational patterns of the Roman Empire, because the Roman Empire was intrinsically hierarchical. Uh, hierarchy was exactly in the, in the flesh and blood of the Roman Empire. It was the, I, I would say, it was the carcasses 
administrative structure, everything, social life. Everything in the Roman Empire was hierarchical, and they believed that this hierarchy is embedded in the, in the, in the, in the empire. That's why uh, Christ, I believe, said that don't be like that. Follow, follow. I understand. Not the button. That's, that's, that's a very helpful point. Thank you for that. Uh, but I can still think that he said that amongst them, amongst the 12, uh, don't quibble which one of you is first. But what is, they are still set apart as the 12 with respect to everyone else. Um, yeah. they, he says that they shall sit on the 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, Christ yeah. himself says this, unless you want to talk about text criticism and somebody, you yeah. know, wanted to say that later, but we're not going to open that can of worms right now. Um, I don't we want to get included in the discussion as well. Uh, I, I don't want to get excommunicated this year. I'm going to wait. Until <laughs> I still want to travel. Oh, oh, I, next. I oh, need next to week. <laughs> so, um, so uh, anyway, you know, this is... I believe, I believe Christ said it to everyone, not just to the, to, to the disciples. That, is, that was the point. That's why we don't take it. Uh, we we don't take this uh, these words of Christ as being addressed just to the apostles, but we we take about it for sitting ourselves. On twelve thrones. Sorry. About sitting yeah. on twelve thrones. You you think uh, you of of everybody sitting in each other's lap? Well, thrones? you know, it, it's a symbol. It's a, it does mean that the thrones will be necessarily in the kingdom of God, you know. And it was an image, helpful image, you know, of again, from the culture of the time. Authority. Yes. Authority. authority again. Again, what kind of authority? And uh, uh, Christ Himself, being God, did not exercise the sort of authority that the Roman world knew. Uh, he didn't sit on the on the throne Himself. Uh, and well, and uh, He made a very clear point that He doesn't want to, to follow he, the. He, he didn't sit like like he's pictured like the Pantocrator dressed. Yeah, like, it's a very good emperor? Byzantine example. That's how the Byzantine. <laughs> I thought he dressed like a Byzantine emperor. Um, okay. Well, okay. in the Byzantine icons, he is, but exactly that opposite to what he intended to present himself. Uh, and uh, and again, hierarchy per se is not evil. It's not bad. It's not my my attitude to this is not uh, realistic or optimistic. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not uh, defending. I'm, I'm also not interested in defending. Uh, you know this yeah. idea. I'm saying that I can't. No, I, it's a good. It's a good way to check this idea. Uh, to you know, to test this idea. Certainly. Actually, I I see. I think um, you know. Also, okay. Let's forget about the way it seems to me that Christ set apart these twelve. Then it seems like their first concern when he physically departs is to maintain this number twelve, separate from everyone else. That, even though everyone else is also witnessing to the resurrection. Again, I'm hearing what you're saying. Even though I, I would like more to explore. Uh, getting back to my question about how you saw, you know, ministry, 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 and yeah. community, community, like to maintain all. That is, that. But let me just finish one little thought. I see it also it, in the biblical understanding of humanity in general. Uh, it's not just Saint Paul, you know, in Ephesians five that seems to offer us this Christian household vision that's very hierarchical, you know. But it seems like in Genesis two. Uh, at the end of Genesis 2, after Eve is created for, from Adam's rib, he names her. He says, she shall be named woman. And this business of naming someone, I don't know, again, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but to name, just like he just named the rest of the animals, and now here comes this other animal, this woman, he names her too. And that's an exercise. Okay, sorry, you just grimaced, but... Uh, that seems to me like a pre lapsarian exercise of his authority over her. Yes, it has been interpreted in the biblical scholarship, I think, as a, uh, as a sign, a token of authority, naming things. Um, that's true. Uh, at the same time, yeah, it should be said, uh, let us take it a, a bit broader, uh, that uh, hierarchy is indeed a, an intrinsic part of many things in the natural world. And there are there are studies, multiple studies on the hierarchy. You know, in in minerals, in the physical world, in in the uh, uh, you know, among the animals, lobsters. 
Jordan, Jordan exactly. Peterson famously did that, you know, uh, anyway, told us all about hierarchy amongst lobsters. Yeah, well, anything, essentially. And uh, they speak about hierarchy uh, even in the institutions which seem to be anti-hierarchical by their conviction, uh, like, for instance, universities. You cannot run a university without hierarchy. And there is uh, an implicit, if not explicit, hierarchy among the professors and so forth. And you know, those professors could be, could be Marxists, you know, very anti-hierarchical and Che Guevara guys, but they follow exactly the hierarchical pattern. So it is very natural. And my point here is that uh, Christianity is not natural. It is supernatural. Natural. Christianity is about overcoming the natural order. That's why I personally am against, well, in this, in this particular point, I'm, I'm a bit anti-Thomist, and I'm a bit against the natural order theology. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it can be really misleading, this natural theology. Let's take one of the institutes uh, or structures of our church, canonical territory, which I explore briefly in my book. Well, you can see this as a sacred institution. Many church, you know, fight each other for the sake of the canonical territory because they believe it's like a, a sacred asset, like a relic. You know, and they fight over a relic. But essentially, it's, it's a very basic uh, uh, biological thing. When apes, you know, protect their territory and they fight each other, it is very natural. But you know, there is nothing, anything sacred in this. Uh, and essentially, the, uh, the, the fight of the churches over its canonical territory is not much different, you know, from the fight fight of cats or lions or apes over there. You know, happy that. Uh, it is natural, but the point of Christianity is to overcome this. This is the key uh, to uh, what you're saying. And for me, it's this explains, you know, this answers all of the questions in my mind because indeed, it's, you know, the church is that which overcomes, uh, you know, yestistva ustave, pobjezdajoce yestistva ustave, you know, eniki sunt, whatever. The order of nature, yeah, natural order, whatever. Yeah, so exactly, the order of nature is overcome um, in something like the church. So yeah, I hear what you're saying, uh, and thank you for that. Uh, and I guess it's understandable that in her historical uh, manifestation and in the imperfect reality of the church, that is the human uh, reality, uh, that we do not achieve uh, that to which we are called you know, it, we don't fully achieve this. Uh, you know, the church is supposed to be one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. That's the call. Uh, yeah. To what extent uh, do we live up to that, right? I, I guess yeah. apostolic, one of the markers apostolic would be also all of those things said to the apostles about not seeking to be first. Exactly. Well, that's a very good point. I, I haven't thought about this, and thank you for uh, for leading uh, us to this uh, conclusion. Well, essentially, in the creed about the church, when it says about the church that it is apostolic, it says essentially it's unhierarchical, because like, we should remind remind ourselves those words of Christ addressed addressed to the apostles: "Don't be the don't try to be the first among others." Right. Right. Exactly. right. That's very helpful. Thank you. I'm glad that we resolved that issue. For everybody, for all time. Um, the other question that I had for you, my friend, is your observations on the priesthood. Uh, for me, as a liturgist, it's very interesting how you say there was a shift from presbyters, right, to priests, because everybody remembers that we yeah. would have the, uh, you know, in the New Testament uh, texts, uh, this designation of uh, some category of presbyters, not distinguishable really uh, at first between them and the bishops, you know. The yeah. Anyway, you observe that um, the shift in the church from having presbyters of the community, that is presbyters of the community, I want everyone to notice that, to being priests of the mysteries rather than primarily of the community, uh, that was according to the model of pagan priesthood, actually. Even the word mysteries in reference to whatever, you know, uh, a little bit secretive things went on um, in the pagan mysteries, well, that was in the hands and in the full control of these specially designated priests, right? So uh, very provocative, this observation of yours, Father Kidiel. Um, could you Tell us, uh, as you know, you eloquently did in the book, what are the consequences of this shift? And 
you know, the consequences of the relationship between clergy and laity, and also importantly, of the laity's uh, vision and perception of the Eucharist. Right, yeah. Well, it has to do with, again, with uh, broader questions uh, about grace. The, the broader context for, for this question is, uh, it has to do with, uh, with uh, great grace. What is grace? How important it is. Uh, it has to do with the questions that we need to ask ourselves before we want to ask, answer the question, what is priesthood? And how it is different from uh, Presbyterian, whatever. Uh, how do we perceive grace and how we do, ac do we access to grace? Whether grace is we receive, that we receive is in abundance or it is limited, uh, and there is scarcity of, of grace. Uh, I believe that the idea of priesthood in the ancient world, I mean the pagan world, and also in the in the uh, world of Judaism, has to do with the limitations of grace. Let, remember that for for the Jewish religion, uh, Jerusalem played a, uh, the most important role. It was the key place. That was the place where people came in order to get access to Shekinah, to grace, to to what Jews received by perceived as as grace, uh, to the divine presence and the mediators between this limited presence of God, which was confined to the temple, and the people were the priests. And uh, all the communication between people and God uh, uh, was performed through those priests. So essentially they were moderators of the scarcity of grace. They were those uh, people who checked and you know, distributed, as it were, to use you know, modern consumerist maybe language. Uh, distributed the grace which uh, was not, which was limited. There was a deficit, you know, people from the Soviet Union remember what, what, what was deficit. There was a deficit of grace. And those priests, well, you know, like those uh, uh, salesmen and saleswomen, especially in the Soviet, you know, shops, who distributed those, you know, uh, small amounts of goods to people who, you know, Stood in long queues. Yeah, you know, the same to, thing to, happen when there's the big rush to get holy water on Theophany. Exactly. exactly. Well, that is exactly that's exactly the point. And again, we have the same phenomenon in the pagan religion, where priests uh, played the role of interpreters of the divine will of the will of gods, and also uh, knew how to perform, how to deliver the you know, what the people wanted from gods to gods and how to deliver, to bring back, the, you know, the will of gods to, to the people. Uh, so it also had uh, to do with the idea of limitations. Now what we have in Christianity, Christ said that he sent his grace, his Holy Spirit in abundance. There was, there was no deficit uh, for, for grace. It was like the capitalistic society you know, for the people from the Soviet Union, abundance like an American supermarket is. <laughs> Uh, there was an abundance of everything where you can get everything you want. You don't need a salesman. You don't need you, you don't need you know a mediator to get a supermarket and to get whatever you want. Uh, excuse me for you know comp for comparing those things, but I think they make some sense, uh, half jokingly. And uh, my point is that Christianity uh, uh, lifted all the limitations upon the abundance of divine grace. We don't need priests in the, in the sense of the Jewish religion or pagan religion for, for that. In what, sense now, do we, in what sense do we? I mean, Christians, I mean, all of us, people, lay people, uh, every member of the church, we don't have the same problem that other religions had before us, particularly the scar scarcity of grace or limitation or deficit of grace. We have uh, the presence of God as abundantly as we want through Christ. Through the uh, arch, uh, arch priest. Okay, but we do need priests, right? Well, we don't need priests in the sense that the Jews or pagans had. That is my point. Uh, the the and, idea of priesthood was redesigned in Christianity exactly in the wake of this new condition of abandon, uh, abundance of grace. The idea of priesthood now was how to help people, lay people, you know, people on ground, to consume this abundance of grace, to lead them, to navigate them through this, you know, sea of grace. In this regard, you know, I, I remember the words of one elder on Mount Athos, 
he used to be an old calendarist. Well, by our criteria, he was a schismatic, you know, for almost all of his time, uh, all his, during this, his entire lifetime. Uh, he was recently canonized by the ecumenical patriarchy, by the way. I think, uh, well, it was uh, Father uh, Joseph the Hesychast. So he was a kind of old calendarist, a, a zealot, a kind of, you know. Uh, and then he decided, well, he eventually converted to join, you know, the, the, the church. And he described his uh, personal impression, what happened, what he felt. He said that before that, I had grace, you know, by spoon. When I joined the church, I had an abundance of grace that just flowed over me. And that is, that's what we live in the church. And the thing is how to navigate in this abundance of the church. So the role of the priest is the opposite to the role of the pagan priests or the Jewish, even the Jewish priests. Those uh, had to, you know, to care about the committee to distribute those small spoons of grace that they had, you know, to, to the people who demanded it. The, the Orthodox, the Christian priesthood oh, when, is about, when you mention a spoon in our time, <laughs> uh, you might... Yeah, yeah, of course, yes. It's, we are talking about the pre-pandemic uh, situation. <laughs> now, uh, this, this being spoon-fed grace uh, can raise some, uh, you know, images. Uh, it's interesting, you know, to, to, for you to mention that. In fact, it's funny because in your in your book you also have expressions like social distancing that mean completely something else when you wrote it. It's a completely different thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, that's why sorry. sometimes they say we, we we are not supposed to have social distancing. We should we should have physical distancing, distancing. But social distance should be the same, close, even closer than it used to be. Right, right. In fact, I I do find that some friendships have. Uh, like been fortified through this but anyway that's a completely different topic listen you're saying right. something very vital now this this we're coming really to uh essential points here i love what you're saying and i hope our viewers are still with us uh everybody you notice i just want to i want to repeat it even though I'm, I'm insulting people's intelligence uh but when father kirill says you know priests uh, you know, offer us this service of helping us navigate the abundance of grace to help people navigate, to help people, um, you know, not to get drunk in it. <laughs> as it were. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's amazing. That's an amazing image, I think. But I want to let let's let's focus in on the ministry part because you know your your big point uh, in this book is to also argue. Uh, you know, that really, instead of ministry and service, the way Christ showed it, you know, washing the disciples' feet and all of that stuff, we get more to underlining hierarchy, you know, prior. Yeah, that's exactly, exactly. And hierarchy in this, in this picture is, um, is a bottleneck for grace, essentially. It's a bottleneck which is created artificially, which is added to this, you know, huge, vast channel through which we receive grace, as it were. Uh, so uh, the hierarchy uh, imposes itself as the distributor of the grace in the same sense as it, you know, as it, it worked with the, with the Jewish religion or the pagan religions. And uh, by the way, speaking about the hierarchy in the Jewish religion, uh, religion, there are studies that I came across that indicate that the idea of hierarchy is not imminent uh, to the well, the Bible itself, it was adopted by the Jewish people, Jewish religion, uh, from the people of the Near East. You know, it was a kind of foreign influence upon the Jewish uh, theology, um, uh, which came from the, from the pagan setting. So essentially, it's um, hierarchy is, well, hi ministry understood as hierarchy is exactly the opposite to the ministry as asserting the abundance of grace because hierarchy is about the limitations it either limits grace or it works functions as if grace is limited right, uh, and you say yeah. i'm going to put up i'm going to put up this quote from your book you say hierarchy emerges when access to the vital resources becomes limited or controlled you know so Oh, that is what happened when the control over the access to charismata was bestowed upon, upon limited offices such as presbyters. So yeah. if you don't mind, continue this thought about um, what actually, uh, you know, Christian ministry is. Yes, it's first of all, it's non-hierarchical in the sense that it is supposed to serve and not to be served. 
uh, because hierarchy by its definition is something that is supposed to be served. Um, that was the idea of hierarchy in the Roman world at least, uh, and uh, later on, uh, that's what the Christian issue turned into eventually. Uh, you know, when we, well, well, there are many forms of, of serving hierarchy when people serve their you know, priests or bishops or patriarchs and so forth. And this is exactly the reversal of the original idea of, of, of ministry, which is supposed to serve others. Um, and I believe that a ministry turns into hierarchy in the bad sense of the, of the word, uh, when, um, when uh, it uh, switches to the mode of being served from the mode of serving. Uh, and, um, uh, well, we need, I think it is still unclear, I hope, well, I, I think, I, I'm afraid, uh, that uh, uh, we, we cannot define clearly what ministry is. We have defined what, what hierarchy is, what, what is ministry. Ministry is exactly to, uh, to help to facilitate a community. That's why ministry is connected to community. To facilitate community to uh, appropriate, to, uh, uh, to adopt this divine grace and to make this divine grace working for everyone, for every particular member of the, of the community. It's like, if you want, uh, let me use another, well, and the same category uh, from the you know, old, uh, old uh, classical theology, which distinguish between particular and common in God, you know, in the human society, in the church and so forth. We can apply this distinction between common and particular also to the salvation. The salvation is given to us, to the entire humankind through Jesus Christ, but we need to appropriate, to particularize this salvation for ourselves. And the purpose of ministry is exactly to help the common salvation given to the entire humankind to be adopted, particularized, appropriated by individual members of the church. That is the purpose, to make this common grace becoming particular grace for this particular person or community. Okay. Does it make okay. sense? Yeah, I think it makes uh, abundant sense. Um, I'd like to, for you to say a few more words about the actual results, consequences for the way the people approach the Eucharist, uh, when uh, there's a certain, one second, the quote I had of yours that I want to focus on. All right, so when you talk about the Eucharist shifting from being a liturgia in the proper sense, the common work you know, of the people, um, yeah. to being a mystery performed by a priest, um, what is happening between you know the people and the Eucharist. Well, that's exactly uh, about again the about creating a, uh, a bottleneck, because mystery, uh, well, at least in the Greek sense of the of the word, uh, mystery is about getting through the bottleneck. Imagine that you are on the on the on the bottom of a of a bottle, <laughs> and you need to get you know up. You need to go through this bottleneck, which is which which is narrow. Uh, so that's the pagan idea of mystery, at least. And sometimes Christians have the same perception of the mystery of, of the Eucharist. They need to go through this bottleneck of you know of of priesthood, whatever. Uh, certainly, we need priests to celebrate the liturgy. I don't I don't deny it. And we need hierarchy to celebrate to to serve to uh, celebrate to serve ministry as uh, mysteries uh, but the thing is that um, eucharist even eucharist is not mystery in the greek sense it's not something which is completely unknown which is you know it's a kind of abyss for the greeks it was an abyss which um uh which was which was somewhere out there and to get there they had to go, you know, through rituals. They had to know, you know, special words, spells. They had to perform special, to make special, you know, movements. It was very ritualized mysteries. They were extremely ritualized. They are still ritualized, especially in the, you know, in the Orthodox and Christian traditions. But it's not like going out there to the abyss, somewhere to the to the cosmos, as it were. It's about, uh, well, that's that's the idea of anaphora and epiclesis and coming, you know. Uh, the entire the discussion about what happens during the liturgy, and you as a liturgist know much better about this. It's about descending uh, somehow, uh, you know, this grace 
uh, the presence of God to the table, to the community. Uh, and uh, in, in response to anaphora, to addressing, you know, God from the community, of course. Um, so it's, it's uh, really not like a mystery in the Greek sense. And it's not about Eucharist in the proper sense, I believe. It's not about navigating through this bottle, bottle as it were. It's about uh, exactly appropriating this abundance of grace given in the Eucharist by the community and by the people who participate in the Eucharist. Yeah, because when you write, you know, that this, the perception of the Eucharist as being, uh, you know, mystery celebrated uh, by the priest, but not by the people really, um, yeah. does create this distancing of the people from, the people do seem distant from the liturgy. I find in my own experience with trying to, you know, contribute my two cents to people being catechized, I find that the least interest, people have the least interest of all the topics that one can offer online, say, in liturgy. Like, uh, people seem to, you know, be very interested in the actual uh, consecrated gifts, but the action of the liturgy, yeah. I yeah, find, yeah. find that of all the things that I've ever uh, offered online of videos, you know, the thing that's actually the area of my expertise of the liturgy. I have this monstrosity of a course that's already 45 lectures and we're only up to the epiclesis, but I have the fewest uh, views in these videos. Uh, and with all of the talk about the holy gifts and of holy communion and access to holy communion and COVID-19, uh, it's funny to me a little bit. I mean, I realize there's other resources, but really there aren't many resources about liturgy. Um, there's just very little interest and I think that this is one of the consequences of what you're describing as a distancing somehow, uh, you know, from the actual uh, Eucharist, from the action of the Eucharist of the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think exactly. that people think that they really have much to discover there, you know. And sometimes people prefer their liturgy to be kept uh, away from them. That's why they really appreciate, you know, icono iconostasis. They prefer the liturgy to be sung in, you know, in the old um, incomprehensible languages and so forth. It's, uh, it's, it's exactly the same. It's probably something like, you know, prehistorical kind of, you know, uh, well, encoded in DNA of people. <clears throat> when they won't want mystery, they want something out there which is inaccessible for them, which is which can be accessed through the mediation of someone through rituals, you know, spells and magic words and, and so forth. It's, um, well, it's somewhere deep in the human nature, which revealed itself, itself very well in the pagan religions, in the mysteries of Dionysus, you know, uh, those famous, uh, uh, of Bacchus even, uh, you know, those uh, uh, mysteries of the ancient world and which Christianity um, obliterated. Because those mysteries, again, I want to repeat myself, those mysteries had to do with the scarcity of the divine presence. And they, they tried to manage this scarcity as it were. Christianity doesn't have this problem. For, for Christianity, there is no scarcity of grace, there is abundance. And the, the issue for Christian means exactly what to deal with this abundance, not what to do with the def deficit, but what to deal, what to do with the, with the abundance. And right. this should frame, I think, the idea of the Christian ministry. All right, thank you so much, Father Kirill. So, you know, there's a lot more to talk about, but I think that this is a, a good length for our show. So I'm gonna say goodbye and thank you I want all of our viewers, uh, if you're chatting with us here live for the premiere, my friends, please thank Father Kirill, uh, hopefully who's chatting with us when this premieres for his thoughts. I hope to join uh, you, yeah. And yeah, when I, you know, when I finish reading your next book, Meta Ecclesiology, everybody, if it's not enough for you when you're dabbling in ecclesiology in this book, then there's this book. They were supposed yeah, I should to say that ecclesiology is, is less interesting and much more expensive than the previous one. <laughs> well, if you know the author, author you get it for free. Um, uh, but I do encourage you people out there, if you have nothing better to do, or you're, you became interested from this conversation to order the book, uh, read something good, right? It won't kill you. I know most of us don't read, read books anymore, but try it, try it. Okay, Father Kirill, so uh, you want to say goodbye to our viewers? 
absolutely goodbye. Thank you for, for being with, uh, bearing with, with me. And I hope, I hope our conversation will bring some, uh, some good fruits. Okay, bye everyone. I'm saying goodbye and I'll see you next week. <laughs>